Hi, I'm Susie Larson. Thank you for listening to Susie Larson Live. Faith Radio podcasts are only possible because of your support. So thanks for giving and thanks for sharing with a friend. It's only just a matter of Welcome to Suzy Larson Live. Always so honored to get to spend this time with you. In fact, I look forward to bringing you conversations every single day that hopefully inspire you in your faith walk, that deepen your understanding of God's Word, and that heightens your awareness of His very real presence in your life. I have two questions for you. You can answer one or both, but remember, texting is sort of my love language, so I would love for you to engage if you don't mind. First one, who is or who are? the most godly, fearless people you know? Do you, can you think of a couple of examples? Maybe they're just, it's your grandma, it's your mom or your dad or a friend, or it's a public figure, but they're godly, they're fearless, and they're engaged, and they inspire you. Who are those people? Tell me about them. Text me, 877-933-2484. And the second one, you can choose one or both of these questions to answer. What's the next fear mountain you need to overcome? What's the next fear mountain? You know how we heal in layers? I think God scoops these things out of the soil and says, okay, time to look at this now. Is there something that um, that it's just maybe you're putting off, but God is bringing up that you need to overcome? And are you actively engaged with God to overcome that fear? Or do you find yourself mostly accommodating those fears in a way that make you feel stuck? Well, our good friend Jamie Winship joins me each month for an identity check. And today we're going to talk about uh, what it means to overcome our fears, what it means to accommodate our fears, and how connected our identity is with the call of God on our lives. And I was just quickly telling him before we got on the air, everywhere I go, I hear people tell me people are testifying to how these conversations are literally radically changing their lives. I mean, from young teens to young 20-somethings to 70-year-old women, when I go out and I'm speaking or I'm out in public, people are telling me, your conversations with Jamie are changing my life. And I praise God for that. So I'm just trusting we've got another life-changing conversation ahead. Got a handful of copies of Jamie's book, Living Fearless, Exchanging the Lives of the World for the Liberating Truth of God. You can text the word book if you want in on the drawing, 877-933-2484. Forgive my voice if I sound a little tired. I'm back in a mode of not sleeping so great. And you can pray for me if you don't mind, because it's torture, but I'm not whining. I'm just saying. All right, let me give you my announcement here, and we'll get Jamie on the show. If you're traveling this season, we want you to take us with you. Our app is free. You can download it for free, and you can live stream our shows from anywhere or catch the podcast after the fact. So you go ahead and go to the App Store and just search for Faith Radio Network, and you'll find it there. All right, let me tell you about my guest. We'll get him on the show. Jamie has decades of experience bringing peaceful solutions to some of the world's highest conflict areas. Starting with a distinguished career in law enforcement, his unconventional efforts to bring about societal and racial reconciliation led him to Indonesia, Jordan, Iraq, Palestine, Israel, and back to the U.S. He's worked with leaders in a variety of sectors from police departments, pro football teams, faith-based organizations, and he's the author of the book we're talking about today, Living Fearless, Exchanging the Lives of the World for the Liberating Truth of God. Jamie, welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's great to be back with you. I'm praying for you to sleep. Oh, thank you. I told Kev, I can leap buildings, tall buildings in a single bound when I'm sleeping, but when I'm not... It's not easy. It's how they torture people. I don't know if you knew that, but it's... No, I didn't. I've, no, I've had that done. So, yeah. Yeah, yes, I'm sure you have. I'm sure yeah. you have a story about that. Maybe you'll have to share that with me someday. But uh, Jamie, before we dig into just the topic that I really you know, want to delve into, just in your time with the Lord these days, what's he been impressing upon your heart? Um, wow, I've been reading a lot lately about um, reconciliation and suffering actually the Mm. combination of the two and how um for reconciliation to occur even in relationship to god suffering was required so that's it's a pretty deep heavy topic but that's what i've been exploring especially the last three weeks okay you're gonna have to unpack that a little bit help us understand (laughs) what you mean yeah well um I was in, you know, I just had it open in my Bible, actually. I was reading through Hebrews um, just because, uh, you know, the work we do um, 
you know, in the Middle East, especially, there's so much conflict and so much death and people get overwhelmed with it. And, you know, you get this sense, well, if, if, you know, if the Lord was in charge of everything, it would be peaceful and we'd, you know, it'd be easy. And then I'm reading Hebrews chapter five, which is one of my favorite passages in, in the scriptures talking about, um, you know, Hebrews two is, um, that God, that in Christ, um, the the threat of death was taken away was taken away from satan mm. and that we were delivered from the burden of the fear of death so it's not that we're all going to die but it's the fear of death that really paralyzes us or the fear yeah. of suffering i suppose and so hebrews 2 goes on and then into hebrews 5 and it talks about jesus um in a, when i'm reading from the amplified it says in the days of his flesh he offered up definite petitions for that which he not only wanted but needed and supplication with strong crying and tears to him to god who was able to save him out from death and he was heard because of his reverent reverence towards god his piety in that he shrank from the horrors of separation from the bright presence of the father and so if you're reading a heavy passage like that especially in the amplified translation but then you're thinking about the time where Jesus actually calls God Abba, you know, there's one occasion and it's when he's in the garden and when he's in his most difficult, you know, lowest point, his team has left him, betrayed him, deserted him. He's all alone. And then he's in his deepest struggle. And it says in Hebrews five, it says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And this completed him, making him equipped to become the author and source of eternal salvation to all to give heed and obey him. So if we're following Christ, um, his path towards being bringing reconciliation between God and man, but even in his own human journey, facing his darkest moment, when he prays, you know, Abba, Father, if there's another way to do this, what is it? But not my will, thy will be done. He's accepting that suffering is the way to glory. You know, yeah. it's the way to the victory, not to find another way around it, but to go through that deepest, darkest fear um, and that we learn obedience to what we suffer. I think that's yeah. just hard for Amazing. us you know, it is. To, to, to deal with that. We don't have a great theology on suffering. We like formulas. We like A plus B to always equal C. And exactly. uh, and that that thinking that you're talking about messes with that. And I, I we probably need to do a, you know a few shows on the theology of suffering because when you meet a suffering saint, you really want to hear what they have to say. I mean, they're experiencing something of God that you can't any other way. He's near to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit, and he's he's so intimate with those who suffer. And um, and I think if we weren't so afraid, you know, when we suffer, we would know what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed to us when he returns, right? Right. right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to get hold of that, of course, yeah. you know, to believe that to be true in our experience. Yeah. So true. Okay. I'm going to pivot. All right, Jamie, okay. besides me, who are some <laughs> of the most fearful people you know? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, yeah. I'm putting myself out there. Uh, besides me, though, seriously, like some of, you don't have to give me names, but tell me a story or two of people who um, who battled fear that you worked with and you saw um, a turnaround. You saw God show up for them in a way that changed the way they do life. Yeah, I you know, I was, when when I heard you talking about that at the top of the show, I was thinking, I was just thinking about this back when I was a police officer. Um, these missionaries came to our church and we, we had them over for lunch and the, the husband, I, I'm, I, I imagine he's with the Lord now, but he was a Japanese born American um, who grew up in Hawaii. And then he got married and they went to be missionaries in Japan, probably, wow, probably in the sixties and seventies. And he was telling me that, when he got there his first four years on the field, um, their mission agency went bankrupt. Um, they were left completely destitute in Japan. And, and being Japanese American, he was despised by the Japanese people because he was mixed wow. race. And their 
only son died. That oh, was wow. all his first term. And when he was telling me that story, he and his wife had been in Japan for like 25 years. And the way he talked about, and I really pay attention to this in people. People, you know, the word to be innocent means to be unwounded again. That's what it means. The innocent is to be unwounded again. And so all of us are wounded in life through all, you know, all kinds of things that happen that are unexpected or whatever. But when I listen to a person who's unwounded again, talk about their suffering, it's just beautiful. It's just, it's like Jesus showing the scars in his hands and in his sides, but not out of bitterness. And he's not weeping because of the torture and the pain. It's be, he's showing, he's saying, touch it. Like, this is the victory. This is not to, that I'm going to, you know, this has ruined me for the rest of my life. This is like part of who I am in my journey. And that missionary, his name was Henry. Just the way he sat there and talked about his life in Japan with such love for the people, love for God, and how the suffering was worth it. And he said a line, I think Helen Rosevere, who's another great person I met, she said at one time when, when she went through the brutality of the Congo rebellion, she said, if you ask me, was it worth it? I would say no. But if you ask me, is he worthy of it? I would say yes. Wow. And that's, that's the kind of, I love that. I want to be like that. Is it ever oh, really man. just worth it for its own sake? No, but is he worthy of it? Yes. Mm. Yes. Why oh, so good. Yeah, the, the Lord keeps bringing me back, Jamie, to, to loving God and loving man, loving others. And fear gets in the way of that, if, uh, you know, a misplaced fear. When we fear God, we need fear nothing else. But if we fear man, we fear circumstances, you really can't love man. It's like if you're fearing scenarios, circumstances, even in this heated political season, you can't at once fear those circumstances and see people who desperately need Jesus, because you you can't. It's the pure in heart that see God. So say a word, if you would, about wrestling past a measure of fear so you can see the people, because the missionaries you're talking about had a vision for the Lord and had a vision for people that, you know, upstaged their desire for self-preservation. Right. Yeah, it's it's... Yeah, when I meet people, I you know, and I say this all the time because we we've been speaking a lot over the last three weeks on this topic of fear because fear is what shuts down everything, and the and the point of fear is to make you pay attention to what's true and not true. Like for example, when I'm reading the scriptures, we were we were doing a training all last week for Christian teachers in public schools. Um, how do I share my faith in a public school where I'm restricted? And how do I, you know, disciple kids when I'm not allowed to say certain words? And I was saying to them, don't don't think of the scriptures as being Christian or non-Christian or biblical or non-biblical. It's what's true versus what's false. That's what it's about. You mm -hmm. shall know and experience what's true, and that will set you free. Not religious, but what's true. And so to demonstrate truth to people, to live out truth, like Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So when you're, what fear does, the beauty of fear is it points to things that you believe that are not true. So in that translation of Hebrews 5 I just read, the challenge for Jesus in that translation is that he doesn't want to be separated from the presence of God. Like that's the, that's the issue to him, the thing that produces the um, pain in him and the despair. Um, but, but the, the, it's because of what is true. What's the, the fear is saying is what you're believing about the situation is not true. And the failure to know what's true is going to hurt you. That's what fear is for. And so once you address the fear and say, God, what is true in this situation that I find myself? Are you able to protect me and my family in a war zone where we have no military around us? Is it true that you can protect us? And is it even true that if something happens to us that we would consider negative, it's to the greater glory. Are these things true? And our fear is pointing to the belief that they're not true. Mm. And, the, and the fear is good. It's valuable to make you tell the truth and, and learn the truth. 
but you can't let fear be a decision maker because right. if fear becomes a decision maker, you'll never go. You'll never mm. do it. Mm. So and that's yeah, a th- fear. I was just going to say fear of definitely when you're beholding fear and not beholding God, you're limiting God all the way yeah. around. You're, you're misjudging God. And as you go to break, I, I brought this up even when you're not on the show, because I think it's so life changing. But the idea of saying to the Lord, being a truth teller to God, Lord, I believe mm-hmm. you're either unable or unwilling to, when you finish the sentence and you talk about what you fear. And Absolutely. then you ask the other questions. What do you want me to know? What do you want me to do? I think that truth telling confession and then letting God speak to that uh, is such a powerful, powerful exchange. When we come back, you you know, I, I don't even care if you tell the story you've told before, but just for the sake of this conversation, I would love for you to share a story about a time when you were in literal danger, because you really have been in places where you've been in danger, where, or at least perceived danger. It could have, it really could have escalated to something that was not good. But the Lord was your guard and your guide. He showed you what to do. And uh, you saw that thing kind of dissipate around you. I know you've got plenty to choose from. Jamie Winship is my guest today. He's one of our absolute favorites. He joins us every month for an identity check. And in a little while, we're going to talk about how um, your identity is connected to your calling. And that is important, especially when you're talking about fears. You don't want to just rush headlong into rush hour traffic to face your fears when you don't know who God is and you don't know who you are. And so there's some... There's a process to this, so we'll talk about that as well. Jamie Winship's my guest, and we'll be back in just a minute. You know, this show is all about deeper life in Christ and powerful life on earth. I try to handpick my guests in a way that helps you cultivate an intimate, thriving walk with God that translates in how you show up on the earth. Because I'm passionate about health and the healing process, we bring doctors on the show. I'm passionate about renewing our mind. We bring a neurosurgeon on to talk about a biblical renewing of our mind, but also adding that science and faith perspective. I talk about how to open God's Word and find His truth in a fresh and compelling way. Maybe someone shared a show with you, and as you've been listening, you realize you like the topics. You're brand new to this whole faith thing. Maybe you've got some questions about what it means to follow Jesus. Well, we're so honored at Faith Radio to partner with the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, and we'd love to help get some of your questions answered. If you've got questions about beginning this faith journey, about starting to trust Jesus and follow him with your life, text the word FAITH to 41224. Trusting Jesus for your eternity and following him every day of your life will be the most important decision of your whole life. Hope you're having a really great day. Thanks so much for tuning in to Susie Larson Live. We've got our good friend Jamie Winship on the show. He joins us every month for an identity check. His book, amazing book, Living Fearless, Exchanging the Lives of the World for the Liberating Truth of God. And I got to tell you, this weekend, I was visiting some old college roommates and their spouses and their kids and a young 20-something, one of my friend's sons, uh, was in Spain with this book, read the whole thing, and had an encounter with God that radically changed his life. And it's so fun for me to get back to Jamie and let him know how uh, his fruit is bearing fruit. And it's just so powerful. we got a handful of copies to give away. You can text the word book if you want in on the drawing, 877-933-2484. One of the questions I ask that I'd really love for you to answer, friends, is, is there a next mountain of fear? Is there something that you've kind of been putting off that... God is saying, I want us to deal with this. And are you accommodating your fears? Or are, you, are you kind of aware of this fear and engage with God to say, this thing's going under my feet? If you can answer that, I'd love for you to text 877-933-2484. So Jamie, in your own life, a time when um, you were in a legitimate situation that could have escalated into something, um, but God guided you, guarded you, and um, de-escalated the situation. Can you think of any story that you want to share? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Pick Can I one. think of something? Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to need inner healing, reviewing all these incidences in my <laughs> I'm life. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess for me, you know, I think there's lots of situations that produce fear in people, but um, I, you know, the, the greatest fear 
which is, is again, using fear as it pointing to something that you believe that's not true, is the, is the human fear that you're in a situation where you're powerless and alone. I think that's the yeah. human's deepest fear. And so when I just think about, Lord, remind me of times when I believed that I was powerless and alone, and you told me the truth, that you're never powerless and you're never alone. And so, the, you, you know, when we work in conflict zones, which we do to this day, <laughs> do to this day, um, I, you know, I just think of the places where I felt the most alone and the most powerless. And for sure, that's when you're out in the middle of, you know, the Sahara Desert, just you and who, two of your team or three, whoever's with you. And you're just so, it, t it takes you three days of traveling to get to this location and you have to get it, go there at night. And you can't be any more distant from anything that you know as safe. Even when, even when you, you know, you're driving the Jeep with a driver you've never met, don't know who they are. They're the only ones that can take you to a certain location. Then you have to get out and meet a person in the desert and walk with them, you know, one or two miles yeah. at night. Hmm. You just don't, you, you're just like alone and yeah. you start thinking, can God go here? And being in that scenario and, di and then with people who are violent, they're in conflict. They've been, they're, they're, they've been in conflict for years and to go in and, you know, sleep among them and then to go into a room with them and they look at you, these leaders, these 12 leaders, tribal leaders, and they blame all of their conflict on you <laughs> or hmm. your team. And so you're starting at such a disadvantage. There's no way to explain your way out of anything or, you know, quote verses to them. They're like, you have no props. And so in that situation with me and my two friends, one of the men in the group, one of the um, Islamic leaders is just screaming his head off to kill us. Like he's just saying it over and over again that we need to kill these guys and, you know, their government people and their, you know, all that. And then in that situation, so I've been in this situation several times in this region, but this particular time, um, I, you know, we're trained for these kinds of situations, but I was looking at my two friends and because they ha they're both believers, the, the two that were with me on this time, and we knew, okay, this person who's screaming for our death, trying to influence the room, He's either, only two things can be happening in this person. Either this person is so wrapped in fear and woundedness that he's reacting against our presence, or this is demonic. It's one of those two wow. things. And they require different responses on our part. This is why the scriptures are so valuable to know. And so we, just because we train together all the time and you can't just do this stuff, you have to practice all the time in the quiet moments in your life to get to these places. But so we knew, so one of the guys in the group, he's sort of an expert in spiritual warfare. That's kind of his expertise. The other, me and the other guy were more in, um, you know, how do we contextualize and work with radical Muslims? And so it was, the question was, which one is it? So the only way that you know in a situation, whether the, what the spirits are, is you test them right? This is First John. You test the Spirit to see if it's of God or not. And the way you test the Spirit is to ask out loud to the person or the Spirit, do you confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh? Like, that's the test. And people read that scripture. I don't know if they think it's serious or not, but that's a serious question. So, and you don't have to yell because if it's demonic, they can hear you whisper. You don't have to yell, but you do have to say it out loud. So, this person's screaming and yelling at us, and we know, okay, if it's demonic, then we know what to do. We know how to handle that. If it's not demonic, then we have to tr we have to help this person in their woundedness. So, um, so the one guy, the, the guy on our team that's sort of the spiritual war expert, the guy's screaming and yelling in in um, Hassaniya is the language they're using, and in English, the guy, our guy on our team, he just says kind of loud enough for the guy to hear him. He says. Do you confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, that he's the anointed wow. one come in the flesh? And in English, the guy switches to English and says, no, I deny it before all creation. Whoa. So we're like, oh. so we're like, okay, demonic. This is just straight demonic. And so wow. we all three shift into shutting down the demonic. We call it silencing the room in the name of Jesus. We have full authority 
in the spiritual realm to just shut this down. If the guy's wounded, you know, and traumatized, it's you don't do that to him. You you go with love and compassion towards the woundedness. But in this case, and so all three of us all we just immediately shifted into we rebuke you in the name of Jesus, we silence you in the name of Jesus, and the guy passed out. <laughs> he just <laughs> fell down on the ground in front of us. And um and the other imams were shocked at what happened. Like they knew something had happened, but they didn't know what had happened. And the guy did not revive until the session was over, far into the night. The wow. next night, the guy comes back into the meeting. He starts again, like da da da. And we do the same thing to him really quick. Just like we silence you in the name of Jesus. You're not allowed to speak in the presence of, of us. You know, we're followers of Christ. In the name of Jesus, we shut you down. And he passed out again. Oh my goodness. And then at the break, we took a break. The other guys woke him up and he came in in the break time and he came up to us and he said, stop doing that to me. <laughs> and we said, stop letting the demonic talk for you. Let's get rid of the demonic so we can talk with you. And that's how he, that's how that guy came to faith was from wow. those. Events. Yeah. And he. So when you he, said st or stop letting the demonic talk to you, did he, what happened next? Did you do a deliverance with him? Yeah. We told, yeah. He yeah. said, I don't know how to stop it. And we said, we, we can help you, but you, but we can help you very quickly. This is very simple to deal with. But when we get rid of the demonic, you must fill the space with Jesus. Like you, we can't get rid of the demonic and you don't do anything about it because it'll come back worse. So this is all scriptural stuff. And so do you, Will you do you agree to receive the gift of Jesus into the empty space in your heart once the demonic is gone? And he said, I will. We've learned this the hard way to make sure you do this this way. Mm -hmm. And um, and so then we then we just, you know, we pray deliverance over him. And the demonic is attached to lie based thinking. The demonic can only be present where there's lies believed. And so so got rid of the demonic. Then we worked on what are the lies he believes in his life about God, about Christ, and we just worked through him, and the truth of Christ set him free. So, And what were the other guys doing while all this transaction was happening? What were the other guys doing? So we like we did we don't try and draw attention to this kind of stuff. So we had him off to the side and we just walked him through. It's very straightforward. The rules in the kingdom are very straightforward. And you just have to abide by the rules as the scriptures lay it down. And so it what they didn't see that process. What they saw was like, for example, Legion come into a meeting cured. That's what they saw. And they were they were it scared them. Just like in the story when, you know, Jesus casts out Legion and the people are like, get out of here. You're scaring us to death. It wow. scared the other leaders because they knew his interaction with us had taken away his violence. Wow. And it scared them that we might do something like that with them. <laughs> so, um, but he was, the, he became then the main advocate of us being there. He, he took over and said, these guys are of God. You know, what they're saying is true. I was wrong. And so then he kind of, he became the insider, we call him. He's, it's like Jesus leaving the cured demoniac in a region that wouldn't accept him. And then he comes back later and then they're able to accept him because of the testimony of the, of the one who was made well. So we just let him kind of lead from then on. And, uh, and yeah, and that was a better witness than us. Hmm. So many things stand out to me, knowing yeah. God's word, immersing yourself in the book of Ephesians, which speaks both of God's love and the and weapons of our warfare, knowing the That's rules right. of the kingdom so that you're not intimidated by the enemy's schemes. Right. And uh, I mean, loving that person enough where you could stand in your authority and not fear his spewing, because there's plenty of different kinds of spewing going on all over in the West. And I think if we could really, really know that God holds all authority and that greater is he that is in us. Our interactions might be so very different. And if you could even discern, is this a fear-based reaction or is this demonic? And then right. proceed forward. That is powerful. So as we go to break, I want to read this. This is from Jamie's book, Living Fearless. Jamie, you write this. The Lord loves you. He will usually begin communicating to you with an affirmation and a challenge, the same way Jesus related to people in the Gospels. This is what you're supposed to be. 
this is what you're supposed to do. So when we come back, I want you to say a word about deeply connecting um, our identity and our calling. I mean, Jesus does that. God does that. So we need to do that. And we'll, we'll pick the conversation up in just a moment. Jamie Winship's my guest. Again, we've got a handful of copies to give away today. You can text the word book if you want in on the drawing, 877-933-2484. I'll be back in a minute. Hope you're having a really great day. Thanks for tuning in to Susie Larson Live, having another fantastic conversation with our good friend Jamie Winship, who joins us every month to talk about fear, to talk about identity, talk about our calling. We've got a handful of copies to give away of this book that's changing lives, living fearless, exchanging the lives of the world for the liberating truth of God. And Jamie writes like he speaks. He's got great stories in this book and great teaching. You can text the word book. If you want in on the drawing, 877-933-2484. And you talked about how when we walk with the Lord Jesus, he gives us an affirmation and a challenge. He, in other words, he tells us who we are, and then he tells us what he wants us to do. So, Jamie, make that connection between our identity and our calling. Yeah, and I think this is really important for people to understand. So when we think of, we think of it as identity and vocation. And so sometimes we get these confused and it's, it's dangerous for a person to get their identity from their vocation instead of bringing their identity into their vocation, which makes a huge difference. So identity is, is the blueprint of who you are, who God knit together in your mother's womb. It's the truest thing about you. It's deeply grounded in love and truth, and it's to be worked out through your lifetime in community. Mm -hmm. And so So being, so identity is being who you are, who I am, and God is the ground of all being. So being informs doing. Identity is the only organizing principle of any living thing in the universe. No living system can organize around any principle except identity. And that means from a cell to a human, to a neighborhood, to a city, to a country. It can only organize around a sense of identity. And that sense of identity can be either true, a true identity, or false. And the way we know that it's false is that the false identity I mean, simply can never find rest. The false identity cannot enter into the shalom of God. It can't. Only the true can be at rest with God itself and others. So when I'm talking to any person and see the fear, which is coming from internal conflict, the internal conflict is the true and the false struggling with against one another, right? And so once that person is able to get to be with God, who's the only one that can reveal true identity to a person, is in an abiding relationship with God in Christ. Once that person is able to to come to a place with Jesus, with God, and say, these are the things I believe about myself that are hurting me, or these are the names that I believe about myself that produce in me fear, guilt, shame, anger, all these things. Those are the false. And as we give those to Christ, who who became sin for us, um, and then ask him, will you help me know and understand who I really am? Who did you make me to be? And that's a that's a not a one time thing. That's a constant journey. Your identity is constantly under assault, just like Jesus was. Jesus was called every identity possible, even called Satan. Mm-hmm. And, and so his identity was constantly assaulted by the world, not his vocation, his identity. Because if Jesus moves away from his true identity, his vocation is meaningless. So for, for a human being, if we don't know who we really are, what you do kind of doesn't matter, right? And so like as Paul's saying in Corinthians, you know, I can speak with the tongues of 
of men and angels and sacrifice myself to the flames and have all knowledge. But if I'm not sourced in the truth of love and the truth of who God is and who God made me to be, all of that's a waste of time. All of it's a waste of time. So that makes identity just the most critical thing. And then once you understand your identity, seen from Adam and Eve through the scriptures, then it's kind of interesting. It almost doesn't matter what vocation you move into because your identity is your gift to the world. So wow. if once you understand your identity, then certain vocations really stand out, especially in younger people. Once they understand their identity, they're like, oh, I know what vocation allows this identity, all kinds of freedom. And then you'll recognize which vocations will actually hurt your identity or put it under a bushel is what we see happen a lot. They live less than who they really are. Um, and so, but no matter what, like if you take, I'm, there's a great pastor I knew um, in, in a big church in a city and he told me before he retired, all he ever wanted to do was be a Walmart greeter. And I said, yeah, that's all you have ever been. <laughs> you just, it's just wherever you are in that identity of greeter, which is what he was, every, people are going to come to whatever you do. They'll come to Walmart. They'll come to the church because what you're giving them is the gift of your identity. It's not the vocation. It's your identity that, that um, brings redemption to the vocation. So well, that's just know, that, the right order. Wow. I was just going to say, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, Jesus knowing who he is, in John 13, it says, because he knew that he came from the Father and would be turned from the Father, he picked up the towel in the basin. It's like because he knew his identity wasn't up for grabs or changeable with popular opinion, the king of the universe did what the lowliest servant would have done. And it's like even the cross was utter shame and horror. And, and you know, yet we wear the cross around our neck because in his identity going to the cross— he turned. He brought dignity there, and I am thinking about that. So different than operating in realms when you don't know who you are, and it's like you're wearing a glove a few fingers off. And I mean, let's take you for example, militant peacemaker. That's one of the identities the Lord really imprinted upon your heart, and it fits. You go to these severe conflict zones and bring peaceful solutions to impossible situations. What would be the worst possible job for you to be in as a militant peacemaker? <laughs> Probably a pastor. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because because what happens is with 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 my identity as militant peacemaker, the the challenge is if if I'm in a situation that's peaceful, I will create conflict. Like that's what my identity needs to have around it is conflict, so it can go into play. And so I'm joking as pastor, but if any time I've been put in a peaceful, calm situation, I've pretty much destroyed that. So. <laughs> The Lord's like, just stay in the war. Please, stay in the war. Don't, Do everyone don't a go. favor. Yes. I think I could make a Quaker movement violent. I don't know. <laughs> that, but. That's hilarious. Oh, my goodness. But I think this is a really powerful example. So speak to the person today who maybe doesn't know if their God-given identity and their chosen vocation are out of sync. Or do you just automatically know because you're disoriented, you feel out of sync? I mean, does a person just instinctively know who I am and what I'm doing are not properly aligning yeah i think i think they have to because otherwise you, you know we would just be guessing all the time i think there's mm -hmm. a i mean i was with some people this morning that um just the level of discontent they feel in a situation that's not violent or anything they're just unhappy or you know this is why i always ask people do you have joy do you have joy because you can be in a concentration camp and have joy because that's where god's invited you to be you can't manufacture the joy that comes from the holy spirit so if they don't have joy i'm always curious like what why are what are you doing then why are you here so i think it's i think it's evident in people but i don't think they're used to telling the truth about it be, what mm. it's so interesting how the enemy works the enemy has this you know we have this scripture like you got to be content in all situations i mean that's first of all that's that's when paul's talking about that he's talking about economic situations in spiritual situations he says don't ever be content you should be mm. always striving and thirsting and running the race but in financial scenarios whether you have a lot or a little doesn't matter be content so when i'm watching a person trying to be content in a in a vocation or a situation where they're clearly not intended to be by god i always ask them why are you trying to like something that god made you to hate
Why are you wow. doing? He doesn't wow. want you to be here. He's not going to let you be content here because your light is under a bushel here. Wow. That's what's okay. Wow. Okay. With just a few minutes before this next break, can you just off the top of your head, I mean, you've worked with thousands and thousands of people, think of identities um, and talk about their dream job. You know what I mean? Just think of if people you've worked with, you go, this is their identity and this is what they do. Like it was a perfect fit. Anything off the top of your head? Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm working with a group of, um, you know, high level coaches, you know, um, professional and collegiate. And when I'm talking to them and I'm just, we, we're just getting into the whole thing of identity, which is beautiful because they're trying to figure out how to help players. And I said, the biggest gift you can give a player is not a national championship or a ring. It's give them the gift of your identity. While you have them with you, give them the gift of your identity because that's what will bring transformation to them. Seeing identity, learning that it doesn't come from a sport. And, and so the ones, the ones, it didn't even matter how successful they were. The, the, the coaches who, when we started working through the identity process, it was clear to them why they were in the vocation. Clear. And they were, if you interviewed their players, those players would do anything to be with these coaches. There were other coaches who were in it for power and fame. And if you went and talked to their players, their players had no sense of loyalty to that coach. Wow. It was all job. It's transactional. We're here to win. If we can't win, we'll go somewhere else. You talk to the ones who the coaches were pouring their identity into those kids. Those kids were getting offers from other places and turning them down just to be with that coach. That's the difference. That's the difference in giving the gift of your identity or just giving them a transactional win or profit from what you're mm. doing. Wow. Okay. When we come back with a few minutes left, we're going to talk about the fear mountain. A dear listener uh, texted and said, I'm embarrassed to say my fear mountain at the present time. I'm I'm embarrassed to say it. Um, And they went on to talk about, I'm not giving names. So talking about a fear of rejection that loved ones won't choose them or think that they're fun or nice or loving or want to be around them. She said, I guess it's fear of rejection. And I, I say to you, friend, that's a common one for so, so many people. So my question to you, Jamie, is we think of folks who have these things that, you know, they're right there under the surface. Um, I don't think that the order of things is to run headlong and face your fear. It feels like first you've got to get a revelation about who God is and who you are, you know, and like you said, what God, who God says you are and what, what God says he wants you to do right? Isn't there an order of things? So I'd love you to speak to that idea of when our fear starts to surface, do we need to sort of reset our course first and go, Lord, remind me again who you are. Remind me who I am and what do you want me to do? Don't answer that yet, but answer it on the other side of the break. Jamie Winship's my guest. We're going to pause here. Just a few minutes left. I just want so much to make this very deep connection about who you are and what God has called you to do. And I love that Jamie made the distinction. You're not what you do. You're someone God loves. But because you're someone God loves... Ephesians 2.10, you're a masterpiece. He has things for you to do. Your identity isn't what you do. It's who you are in him. But because it's his great treasure to work through you, it's your great privilege to work with him. So we'll be back in just a minute. Faith Radio podcasts are produced by the listener-supported ministry, of Faith Radio. If you're interested in becoming a team member, a donor to this ministry, you can support the podcast anytime and donate at myfaithradio.com. Thanks so much for tuning in to Susie Larson Live, having a really thought-provoking conversation, as they all are every time Jamie Winship joins me on the show. He joins me once a month to talk about fear, to talk about identity and calling, and today is just a wonderful, unique conversation. We're drawing from his book, Living Fearless, Exchanging the Lives of the World for the Liberating Truth of God. And in your book, you talked about how God will begin with an affirmation and a challenge, the way he did in the Gospels, like, this is what you're supposed to be. This is what you're supposed to do. And we've been connecting our identity and our calling, I mean, how God just so beautifully links those and how it, it's important to know that because if you're out of sync, if you're miserable, if you're discontented, it might be that you're 
in the wrong space, that God has something so much more for you. But we're also talking about fears. And just going after our fear, Jamie, without seeking an encounter with God seems a bit out of order to me, but I, correct me if I'm wrong. But don't we need a fresh encounter with God and a fresh revelation of our identity as we face some of the things that um, plague us? Yeah, absolutely. That's, you know, and that's what we've been talking about is f- the value of fear. F- you know, you and I have talked about this before. Fear, humans are only born with two um, innate fears, the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. All other fear is learned. So when we're afraid of something, fear is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, but we need to we need to bring it immediately to the Lord and ask the Lord, what am I afraid of? What, what is it that I'm believing that's producing the fear in me, right? So you don't want to just focus on the fear itself. You'll just cope with it or you'll ask God to take away my fear. What you want is to take away the lie that the fear is pointing to. And mm-hmm. so, um, so it's very important. You don't want to vacate fear. It's valuable. It's a survival mechanism. It's incredibly helpful. Um, you just don't want it to be the decision maker of your life. So yeah, absolutely. When, when I'm afraid of something, as soon as I feel it, my question to God is, God, search me and know me. What is it I'm really afraid of right now? What is it I'm afraid of? And as the person that wrote in said, you'll get pretty quick to, if you're honest, if you're t- truth telling with God is, I'm afraid of rejection or I'm afraid of disappointing someone, or I'm afraid of failure, or I'm afraid of dying, right? Which which then ultimately will lead you to what is your view of God? That's where it's always mm-hmm. going to end up is like, what do you believe about God then, right? And that's what you want to get to because God is constantly correcting our views of him Um, of ourselves and others so that we can love God and love ourselves and love others in the right way. So that's, that's what it's for. And you're right. You don't want to just say, well, I'm going to prove I'm brave. That's what got our team killed in Iraq was one of the people on the team just trying so hard to prove they weren't afraid. And that's the wrong way to think about it. Ah, so appreciate that because perfect love casts out fear. Your striving doesn't cast out fear. Your bravado doesn't cast out fear. You need an encounter with perfect love because that's when you get wisdom. I'm especially thinking of you guys in these conflict zones. You have to have a healthy fear of God to discern what to do because every strategy is different, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And and because our relationship with the Lord is is vibrant and it's and God is always teaching us new things. It's not static and formulaic. So every situation, I think this this is what we read in the scriptures, watch the different characters in scripture facing situations. It's always different how God responds, but it's consistent. Like the details are different, but the themes are like he loves you. God is for you. God is God is merciful. God is kind. God's wrath is revealed against ungodliness it, like that those are all true and as you encounter those different situations fear is a is an indicator of where you're off track and so yeah so when you know when i mean even in things where we've been invited into lately um when i think about the situation i'm like wow oh i don't know if i want to get in that situation then I asked the Lord, Lord, why would I not say yes to this? What are the mm-hmm. things that would cause me not to say yes? Because McCullum, who trained me, used to always say, there's always 10,000 good reasons not to do something God invited you into, <laughs> always. <laughs> and so you want to ask those questions. Um, someone just emailed me recently and said, I just got accepted to this major PhD program, very difficult to get into. Um I'm happy I got into it, but I I have a secure job. (laughs) What should I do? And I said, tell me the reasons you wouldn't take the PhD. What are the reasons you wouldn't go? And if every reason is money, you're thinking about it the wrong way. So the fear is very valuable, right? It's telling him, you don't think God can take care of you unless you have this secure job. So you're never going to go into the program, basically. And that was really helpful to him. So, yeah, I, and I, 
you, you know, when you get down to what are you afraid of rejection, I was just thinking of Isaiah 53, 3, where Jesus faces rejection. Bonhoeffer, I was reading an article by Bonhoeffer the other day, and he said, he, he said, remember, we follow a loser. That's what he said about Jesus. Wow. He didn't win. He lost. But in his loss, he won. Because when he was despised and rejected of men, um, that was hurtful. But if you asked him what's his view of the Father, it's, it's never rejected. Always yeah, loved. And if, by if God. We're, yeah. if, Right. And if that's not enough for us, then we're in trouble because then we're going to keep looking to people to validate us. And now you're trapped. Well, Jamie, we're out of time and this was so powerful. I never know. I mean, I have a sense because I make my plan and prep for you, but I never know where God's going to take us. (laughs) This was fantastic. We love and appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you for the time today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, bless you and greet Donna for us. Jamie Winship is my guest today. Living Fearless is his book. We'll leave that drawing open for a little bit longer. Let's keep walking intimately with God. Let's keep asking him for fresh revelations of who he is and who we are, and then live into it, step into it, and see what God does. He's good God. We'll meet you back here next time. Thank you for listening to this conversation from Suzy Larson Live. These conversations are available because of your support. You could become a supporter now at MyFaithRadio.com. Please subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any episodes and then share it with friends so together we can all have a deeper life in Christ.